Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast here, Monday edition of the show. Tough Monday for the Oregon Ducks. I uh, have a strong inkling. A lot is a lot of this podcast is going to be consumed with what happened Saturday night in Salt Lake City and the ramifications that come with it. Of course, what else would we be talking about, Matt? This is the whole story is the Ducks are out of the college football playoff and people are not happy. Um, I think we're talking a lot of people off the ledge or maybe we're or maybe we're t- telling them to jump. I don't I don't know what our, I don't know what the it's verdict is. But uh, well, I mean, not not fig- it's a figurative comment. Here. I'm not literally telling anyone to jump. But I mean, there's, I there's certainly some questions here that that suggest the program is kind of broken um, and we'll kind of get to some of that. So first one from at pack underscore surf rider. If the Ducks, this guy's got a real rosy disposition here, a lot of uh, optimism here from Pac Surfrider. If the Ducks can win with style against the Beavers and Utes, can they get back into the conversation of the best four teams? And in parentheses, he writes, this is all hypothetical, Bama gets blown out, the Wolverines win, and Cincy and Notre Dame lose. Or has this game exposed fractures within the locker room that could lead to more losses? Hashtag odds and Um Two parts. First part, I, there's no way Oregon gets back in the college football playoff picture at all from here. Um, yeah. It's just not going to happen. Um, just, just I thought, and I would answer that question just to start because I'm sure there are some out there wondering, you know, could, if Oregon falls to say nine or something, maybe eight or nine to ten. I think that's probably the range they are on the new rankings that come out on Tuesday. Can Oregon get back into it? And the answer is no. I mean, they have two losses. A two-loss team has never made it. Oregon's resume was already basically based on one football game as it is it was kind of I want to say it was flimsy but it was a resume with one loss that people around the country were kind of questioning if they belonged in the top four obviously they I think were deservedly so in there um so the answer to that one unless you guys have a differing opinion is is no I I think cultural playoff has clearly sailed this year that's not a thing that happens in, any disagreement no yeah okay to the next part <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I figured I just thought I'd throw it out there unless you guys have conspiracy theories um to the second part, and I think it's a legitimate one that we don't necessarily have a, a clear indication from, but are, are we worried about the locker room being splintered? And then the next part is the part that I think we can tie into the next couple of questions, but more losses. I mean, I, I think that's a certainly a reasonable question. And it starts yeah. with Oregon State this weekend. They're going to have to play better than they played in Salt Lake City. And then if they do win that game, and Jared and I talked about this at the, po- at the kind of tail end of our, our post-game recap on Saturday. What's the confidence? I, I, I'll ask you this, Matt. Um, what's your confidence Oregon can beat Utah after how bad Oregon played in that game and how dominant they, you know, Utah looked in a win? Can, can Oregon flip the script in a couple of weeks here if they do Matt, meet again in, on December 3rd in Las Vegas? I do think it was kind of a perfect storm in Salt Lake City. That environment was jacked up. I mean, you guys know it better than I do, but it felt – electric yep. through the TV. Um, I think Utah played its best game of football and Oregon probably played one of its worst games of football of the season. Um, and that's not trying to take away anything that Utah did because a lot of Oregon struggles were rooted in what Utah was doing. Um, that being said, I, I would pick Utah to win, but I would be absolutely floored if, Utah wiped the floor with Oregon a second time in three weeks. Um, I don't. Th- I think that was about as bad as Oregon could play in all three phases and coaching and mixed into that as well. So I guess my confidence would be like medium that Oregon could win. Like it wouldn't surprise me, but I would also come out and say like they probably would lose by seven to three points. Jared, Jared you told me after the recap yeah. show, ask you in a couple of days. It's been a couple of days. Do you have an answer? Or are you still kind of waffling in uncertainty? I mean, there's a little bit of waffling. Um, I'm probably not very confident in it right now. Like, I agree with Matt that it was a bad game for Oregon. I don't think it was one of their worst games. I just think they got absolutely outclassed, outcoached, and outschemed the entire game. Utah played their, their, like, their whole game plan to perfection. They stopped Oregon's run. They put Oregon into the worst scenarios in their offense, which means third down and long where Anthony Brown has to throw. And they stuck to it the entire night. And they also put their put Oregon's defense against the wall. And so, like, there's nothing about that game that makes you feel like Utah wouldn't try to do the exact same thing the next sure. time. 
And honestly, knowing how good of a coach Kyle Whittingham is, I would say they wouldn't do the exact same thing. I think they would try to mind game Oregon and uh, you know get them to assume that they're going to go one way and then zag and go the other way. Um, so my confidence in general is low. I just don't like the way how Utah always plays Oregon. It's always a close game. It's always competitive. Um, other than the Pac-12 or the 2019 Pac-12 championship game, um, but yeah, that was just uh, Eric. We, you and I talked about this. It's just Utah was the one team that wasn't going to let Oregon get away with their mistakes. And every time Oregon shot themselves in the foot, Utah took advantage and capitalized on it. And while Oregon for the last few weeks, other than last week, showed that they weren't shooting themselves in the foot as often, that is still an issue with this team. And it has been all year long. And if they continue to do that, and if they meet in two weeks in Las Vegas and they're to continue to shoot themselves in the foot, Utah would continue to take advantage of it. So don't feel great. I I think part of what happened in, in Utah was a snowball effect because, and this is where my confidence that Oregon could play them better stems from. Um, I, I think Oregon did themselves a disservice where think about the week that they had. Okay. Micah Pittman quits the team, transfers out of the program. Johnny Johnson is out for the year going into the week. Jalen Red suffers an injury in practice on Tuesday and is now out for the season. So your three of your four or five best receivers are now off the table. They didn't run the football. Like they were trying to outsmart themselves, I th- I think. And their their best offensive weapon is Travis Dye, and they didn't go to him. And when they fell behind, they – they got caught into the trap of not playing to their style of football and trying to play catch up. Um, And the the special teams mistake, I mean, that game easily should have been like 21 to 10 or something of that nature um, because of the blocked field goal. That was just putrid. And then a touchdown that got, you know, a, a, a drive that could have, been a touchdown, got negated by a really bad holding penalty. They didn't stick with their their best player offensively. The punt, and you know all of those things, like you said, Jared, like like Utah made Oregon pay for every single mistake, and a lot of those mistakes though were self inflicted mistakes, and so I I just that's where my confidence comes from that they could at least keep it where in the fourth quarter they have a chance to win the game. I'm not saying that they're going to, they would win, but I I think Utah played about as good as they possibly could. And if Oregon can, can play a better brand of football in two weeks, if they even get there, that's the, that's the, that's the thing. Um, I I think we'd see a better game, but beating Oregon state is going to be incredibly hard because they have the same type of offense, the same game plan that Utah does. They have tight ends that are good over the middle and they have two of them. They've got a really good running back. They've got a really good offensive line and they've got a quarterback that is able to just make the plays that are needed and manage the game and make the big play when called upon. Yeah. We're going to get right to the next question, Oregon state. So I want to hold some of that, the conversation. I will also just acknowledge, I agree with kind of both of the points you're making about the Utah Oregon game of if Oregon plays and makes the same mistakes it just made against Utah, they have, they have no chance of beating Utah. They won't yeah. be Oregon state. Um, they, they've, you know, their execution was, was putrid in certain parts of the field. They couldn't get off the field on third down. Um, you know, if they shore up either of those issues, those things, the game could be more competitive. I don't know what my confidence level is necessarily that they do play significantly better. I think there is a, a high level of pride on this team. I think it's part of the culture Mario Cristobal build. So I don't expect them to just mail it in if they do get to play this game against Utah again. But um, we've all year been talking about how inconsistent they are and they make some mistakes. And maybe this is just kind of who they are. And maybe they do play a clean, perfect football game. And if that happens, there's no reason they can't beat Utah. If they play at their very, very best. It's just how likely does that feel? Um, I don't know. It's just hard right now to say we're coming off a game where they just kind of made all sorts of mistakes. A lot were self-inflicted. Some weren't. Um, and I think it's really hard to have a whole lot of confidence in a matchup after they lost by 31 points. Um, but I do also see like a path 
a path where they play a lot better, where, where maybe they do pull it out. All right, um, we are going to get right into that Oregon Oregon State matchup here with a question from at Louis Bond. Ducks face another physical team with a talented running back this week against Oregon State. Is it possible that the Ducks lose this game to the Beavers? And the, ab- the answer is absolutely yes. Of course, it's possible. But, I mean, Oregon State a year ago beat this Oregon team, and these teams are a little different this year. I think Oregon State mm-hmm. probably a little better this year, which is surprising because they lost a lot from last year's team. Um, I mean, you think about offensively, it's a lot of a lot of the guys that were keys a year ago in, in beating Oregon are not on Oregon State's team this year, and yet they're still among the best teams offensively in the conference. And defensively, it seems like they're even even better. And part of that is it's more it's some, I think, more continuity there. Obviously, lost Hamaclar, Rashad, um, but overall, it's it's a little different Beaver defense. Oregon has to get up for this one. You know, I mean, I think that was one of the things that Mark Cristobal said that stood out to me in the post game was just that they didn't have a response, they didn't have an answer once Utah kind of hit them in the mouth over and over again. They need to get off the canvas here against the Beavers. Um, if they play a, a CD level game, they'll lose. I don't think there's any question. I mean, if the same performance we just saw them have in Salt Lake City shows up again at Austin Stadium and they're unable to punch in points in the red zone and they can't get off the field on third down and they're allowing big plays over the middle of the field to the tight ends. And as Matt said, Oregon State has some good ones there. Um, then this one probably is going to be tough. But I, I just feel like Oregon has to play better. Yeah. Have to play better. And if, if it's a repeat of this, not only does the cultural playoff disappear, like the whole shebang goes away in two weeks. And that will be looked at in the future as one of the most disappointing conclusions to an Oregon football season. If they lose this game, yeah, it's, it goes from one week, they're number three with everything at play to now they're not even going to play for a conference championship. Yep. That's tough. That's really tough. It's what I said in the, one of the columns I wrote after the, the Utah loss is that this season is now on the brink. And as crazy as that sounds, because like the scenario you just ran through, if, if they lose to Oregon state, they finish the year nine and three. They don't win their division and they're not making the conference championship game. They're not even making a new year six bowl game as an at large bid, which is possible if they go to the championship game and lose. Um, mm-hmm. And all of a sudden this season would feel fair or not like a failure. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. and that, that that's cruel and cold, but, that's kind of how it would be viewed and fe- and and felt because you're in the playoff discussion. The path is literally there for you, for you to take it. And not only do you not make the playoff, you don't even win your conference. You don't even win your division. And you're playing in a bowl game in San Antonio uh, or you're playing in the holiday bowl or you're playing in the sun bowl, like, which just feels really strange this is yeah just like what you guys are saying um this could all go downhill really fast and life has come at oregon very fast in the last 48 hours um yeah i mean the the potential of of going to the playoffs was always there um and then all of a sudden it's like well we might be in the alamo bowl (laughs) and that's quite a substantial drop off um it's it's an odd one. Um, Oregon State's a very good team, uh, seven and four. They've had a great year. They're undefeated at home, uh, which is unbelievably impressive. And they can beat Oregon on a, on a good Oregon day, and I think they could absolutely beat Oregon on a bad Oregon day. Uh, the Ducks need to come out for once, basically this season, and you know play with their hair on fire. Because yeah. far too often they've gotten off to really slow starts. And Utah was a team that took advantage of that. That's just another self-inflicted wound that Utah took advantage of. Um, Oregon State will get up for this game. They are the underdogs. They are the, the proverbial little brother of Oregon. Um, and so they're going to they're going to try and win. And obviously that's a stupid thing to say that obviously they're going to try and win, but they're going to try, emphasis on try, to win because this is their season defining moment. Um, Oregon's already had two of them. They had Ohio State and they had Utah. 
Oregon State hasn't really had one of those things, but this is this is it. This game against Oregon, uh, this rivalry, uh, a trip to the Pac-12 championship on the line. This is a huge game for both teams, and there's no doubt in my mind that Oregon State comes out to play. That's just how they've played all year. That's how they're coached. Um, I do think Oregon comes out to play too, but they need to start fast. They need to show adjustments mid-game instead of at halftime. Uh, this needs to be one of their better performances, and they need to put some confidence back into the voters of, of any poll uh, that they can still go out there and win a win a good fo- win a football game against a good team and do it convincingly. Because after last week's performance, I'm not sure how many people still think that. It's a huge test of the culture. Yep. What, how, how do they show up on Saturday? You know, I mean, this is this. They just got knocked to the ground. And, and, and beaten pretty good there, kind of get kicked on the ground too, because not only do they lose the game, lose it in an embarrassing fashion, the discussion all week, and we've seen it in the days following it, has been extremely critical of this team, um, and rightfully so. That's how it works when you lose a game like that. Where's their mental toughness at? You know, And this is so much of what Mario Cristobal preaches, is this culture, this getting back up, the one and all mentality. Where are they at with that? Are they able to do it? I think that's the big test for me this week is, is it's going to be a lot of it's going to be kind of intangible, emotional. Um, where are they at kind of mentally? How do they recover from some big losses from a injury perspective? We talked about receivers. We've yet to speak with Mario Cristobal on Monday, but potentially Ron McKinley, the third could miss this game or future games. Um, there's just a lot going on right now. And you just kind of wonder, what the status is, you know, the question at the beginning of the question was kind of potential of this locker room kind of splintering or yes. Splintering. Splintering. Is that happening? Where are they at? And I think that's kind of what we'll we'll see. And like Jared said, I think we'll have a pretty good idea of that early on on Saturday with how they come out early. Yeah. All right. Third one from at Quackhead12. Do you have any concern about the future of the quarterback position? A team needs an elite quarterback to be playoff competitive. The one you see in the current landscape would have been able to supplant a B regardless of age. And I think a B is a solid quarterback. He's just not great. Hashtag odds and audibles. Um, so a couple questions about this specifically should Oregon have replaced Anthony Brown during the game or should they replace Anthony Brown against Oregon state or Ty Thompson. Um, and then this one specifically just the long-term viability of Ty Thompson, Jay Butterfield, and Robbie Ashford. I mean, the real the real answer is we just don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of – it's one thing to make a judgment call on the future of Ty Thompson when he started three games next year, you know, after he's played Georgia and he's played out the rest of the non-conference schedule because we have actual games to kind of compare it to. It's another thing for us to sit here based upon, what, like 16 pass attempts, 20 pass attempts, something like that, and try to suggest we have any idea of kind of what this is going to look like next year. I mean, from a recruiting ranking perspective, he should be really good. And we've seen players from this recruiting class that he was ranked, you know, in the whereabouts of, you know, obviously Caleb Williams at Oklahoma play at a really high level. And that was somebody who, you know, I won't say Ty Thompson was rated favorably because he was, you know, ranked down uh, behind him, but somebody that at least was a conversation or a comparison, comparable player. So it was that part, but like, what evidence do we really have to, to draw any kind of conclusions here about the future of this quarterback position? And if you want, you could make that about how Oregon has handled reps this season because we haven't seen those guys. At the same time, they have huge aspirations all season. And that's, I kind of took right. offense a little bit with some of the throw Ty Thompson out there, you know, may, may, maybe for a drive at the very end of the Utah game, but you're still trying to be competitive there. And you throw him out there, it doesn't necessarily improve this situation. And I, I really don't think the idea, and I don't know, maybe you guys disagree, of starting of Ty Thompson's first start being against Oregon State in a rivalry setting with the Pac-12 division on the line, like that that would be, I don't know. I mean, you disagree with that? I mean, what's your mind on that? This is exactly what happened last season. Exactly. Where the fan base was not happy with the way Tyler Shuck was playing quarterback, which I, by the way, didn't think was outrageously bad. Um and they were demanding and 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 hoping that Anthony Brown would be thrust into the starting lineup 
in the Pac-12 championship game and then in the Fiesta Bowl. And I had doubts that it would work because we hadn't seen Anthony Brown all year. And there was so much on the line. And yes, they did go and they did beat USC um, in that football game. But they went and played Iowa State and they got smacked. And the offensive inability to move the football up and down, they, they had some positive drives early on, but it was evident the offense was not up to par. The defense was having an off day and it led to a blowout. And this is the same thing that's happening now. I, I have a hard time with everything that's on the line. You don't beat Oregon State. You don't go to the Paxwell Championship game, and you're giving away an opportunity at the Rose Bowl, which is still there, which is still a viable option. And you're going to just do it and roll it with a, with a true freshman or a second-year freshman quarterback that have played very little snaps, and look, if, if these two guys were so quick to anoint re- recruits as like the next best thing, and like I've fallen for that as well. I, I, so I'm not trying to sit here and say I've, I've not done that because I, I did it with Kingsley. I thought Kingsley would be a starter midway through the season and he, he didn't even make it with the program for half a year. Yeah. But we're so, we're so adamant that these guys are going to play right away and they're going to be really good. If that was the case with one of these freshman quarterbacks, we would have heard something. Something would have gotten out like it did with Justin Herbert, like it did with Marcus Mariota, quite frankly, like it did with Brian Bennett. And we don't hear any of that. And it's not because the program is quiet, because we've we've certainly heard things about what's gone on in practice this season. But we've not heard one peep about any of the freshman quarterbacks. Hey, you know what? This freshman quarterback is balling right now in practice. And if Anthony Brown has a bad game this week, we might hear a discussion of a quarterback change. We haven't heard a peep of that. So, t- 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 sorry, but not, I know, Jared, you have a point too. We'll get to it. But t- does that make, I mean, your answer to the original question, then you, you, there should be concern then about the future, future of the quarterback position, Matt? I'm just curious. I mean, I, I don't disagree at all with what you're saying because you're right. We haven't heard as many glowing remarks or anything independent, um, you know, through sources that suggests that one of these quarterbacks is ready to go. But, like, is it a legitimate question then to question the, I guess, the viability of the quarterback position going forward? I think so. I mean, I, I think it is something to be said that Pittman, who has started seven games this season, and look, we can say anything we want about Pittman's lack of ability to, to commit to blocking. We can say what we, you know, Pittman's drops this season, um, his social media aspects. But the reality is, is he's a good football player and he started seven games for Oregon this season. And I think him and a lot of Oregon's receivers were underutilized this season. And he felt like the quarterback room this season wasn't good enough for his best interests. And what was to come, because Anthony Brown can't be on the roster next year. He wanted out and he, he wasn't happy with what his role is going to become. And that is an issue. I, 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 is it one where it's full stop? Everyone stop here. We've, we've got a major fire alarm and all engine trucks come to the fire. No, but one of your most prominent players last couple of years and the guy that you were going to lean on the next couple has said he doesn't feel the confidence and is going to leave. I think that's concerning. I, I don't think it's concerning. We just don't know enough. We don't know anything really about the backup quarterback. So why should I be concerned when I know literally nothing? Um, so that answers that question pretty much. Uh, the In terms of like with Anthony Brown and then and, and people asking for Ty Thompson to start against Oregon State, you need to stop. It's not happening. If it were going to happen at some point during the year of Ty Thompson making a start over Anthony Brown, it would have already happened. It's certainly not going to happen now. And now what is the most important game of the season for Oregon? Because – no win. They don't go to the Pac-12 championship game. They don't have a shot at any of the New York Six Bowls. They need Anthony Brown to play. And, again, this this narrative that one of these freshman quarterbacks is better than Brown, um, while it could be true, we have no idea. You have no idea. We don't go to practice. We don't ever see these guys actually throw or anything like that. We only see their in-game reps. And it's very clear that Anthony Brown is, is the guy. 
And if it weren't, if Anthony Brown weren't the guy, so clearly in practice, there'd be a change made. So that's where we're at in all of this. This is the same discussion we've been having since yeah. freaking like week five of this week four of the season. And I was one of the main people who was like, yeah, I could, uh, I don't know, man. I was, t- I was saying this type of stuff after the first scrimmage that we saw in August, August, where I'm like, Hey man, this Ty Thompson kid looks pretty good compared to Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown probably just had one of the worst scrimmages of his life, but it was the only one that was, that was accessible to anybody, fans or the media. And that's the issue is that we get these glimpses and we're like, yep. oh, wow. Do you remember when he look, ran through his progressions in August? Wow. Amazing. Well, that, that team looked unbelievable in August because, A, they were playing themselves and knew it was going to happen. And, B, they were fully healthy. There were no issues. But here we are. It's We're in November and having the same damn conversation we had in September. So it's not going to happen. Yeah. Everybody wants Ty Thompson to start against Oregon State. Stop. Just stop yeah. it. I, and I'm not, and I'm not an Anthony Brown. You know, I, I'm not trying to sit here and champion Anthony Brown because I, I think he has some traits that he's good at, but I think he has a lot of traits too that he's very average at. And I don't think they have had the year that they needed to have, that they should have had, that the receivers expected to have from a passing standpoint. And it's created um, a situation where there's a lot of pressure on the run game to be successful because if they're not, the offense is going to be really bad. And you, and you can't, you, you can't have it be skewed that heavily towards one aspect of your offense to be that successful I, at this high of a level, you have to have success in both, in both areas and be good at both areas. And I think Oregon is average and at, at best in the passing game, they're really good in the run game, but, as we saw, like if if you fall behind in the run game, you, you need to lean on the pass, and, they, and they're just not there. And so I, I don't want to come across like I'm not being critical of Anthony Brown because I, I I just don't I don't think he's very good as a passer. But there's more that goes into that position, and he's the best one of that group of the guys that they have on the team. And that to me is is the is the concern that. It's not even like a discussion. We don't know about Anthony Brown or we don't know about Ty Thompson or Jay Butterfield or Robbie Ashford because we haven't seen them enough. But to me, it's it's a concern that there's not even like an inclination of, hey, this Utah game is out of out of the realm of, of coming back. Let's just throw Ty Thompson or let's throw Jay Butterfield into the game and just give them a couple possessions and evaluate them and see if maybe in a live situation they're better than expected. They're not even that 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 level of confidence with the staff where that's happening right now, which is to me that's where the concern comes from. And it's not overly, by the way, it's not overly uh, different from 2019 with Tyler Shuck not getting inserted into games for Justin yeah. Herbert. I, and I and so I think that's part of just the way Mario Cristobal operates. Um, is I, he, he doesn't seem like he likes to play his backup quarterbacks very much unless it's like a clear situation. I don't know. I mean, I would have, I, I kind of would have thought you could have inserted him for a drive at the very, very end of the game. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying you start the second half with him and you make it look like it's an actual change, but Anthony Brown was pretty beat up and the game's out of the, I mean, the game is completely out of hand by the time Oregon gets the ball. If it's third possession in the fourth quarter, um, Give Ty Thompson a shot there. The fact that they didn't, I don't know if that's telling of Ty Thompson as much as that's just telling of what it, Mario Cristobal does with backup quarterbacks. It doesn't seem like he wants to play them. Um, Ty Thompson, by the way, still has uh, – he can play one more game and not burn his redshirt year. I think that's something to monitor. He's played three. Um, so that's something to kind of keep an eye on in these next couple of games here if they play him and they get to that number or not. So uh, let's move on to the fourth question from at heart underscore Lee. With the avalanche of catastrophic injuries this year, does Mario Cristobal make moves with his strength and conditioning slash training staff after the season? At, uh, <laughs> Jared's like shaking his head before I even finished the question, which is why I was laughing. Um, he also used the hashtag Hots uh, and Audibles. Thanks for using that heart. Um, Jared, you just want to answer this because you were pretty demonstrative there with your body language that you didn't think it was a good question. So go ahead. Their injuries. Like, there's nothing an injury staff can really do about this. Um, everybody's going to remember this year because there are so many injuries 
and that always sucks. And there's so many injuries to star guys too, or maybe not star, but very notable and important people in the season. And that's, this is football. This happens all the time. Um, and because fans pay close attention to their team, when their team is hit with the injury bug, it has to have some reason behind it. Look, this, this hasn't happened in years prior under strength coach Aaron Feld. I don't anticipate to happen in the future. There are only so many things that a strength coach can even do to try to prevent injuries of this nature. I mean, Bennett Williams like, broke his fibula. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. You know, Justin Flo broke his foot. And on a, on a, I don't even know when it happened. Nobody knows when it happened. It just, just happened and he showed up in a boot against Ohio State. And so these are the issues where a strength coach probably can't do anything about that. They're just mishaps. They're mistimings. Um, like on Jackson Power Johnson's injury where he sprained his ankle. He just got rolled up on. And, and we're, Oregon's probably lucky it was just a sprained ankle. Ryan Walk, same thing. He got rolled up on and then his leg went out. These aren't things that you can prevent as a strength and conditioning coordinator or as, a, as part of the staff. It's just a very physical sport. And Oregon has been plagued with injuries, which is extremely unfortunate for them because we won't be able to see what this team will look like at full strength for more than one quarter against Fresno State. And it sucks. I get it. It's, it's, it's annoying. It's annoying from, from our perspective, too, because you have all these talented kids and that we wanted to see develop and grow into their you know, freshman and sophomore and junior campaigns, and they just all get hurt. But it's football. It sucks. Um, some people are more injury prone than others, but this is just how it works. So the answer to the question, no, or Chris Ball isn't going to do anything about the strength and conditioning staff. Jared said it as good as I would have. Um, so I'm going to pivot and say I do think there needs to be some discussion about what's going on at certain positions on the team. And I mean, special teams has been really bad the last three years. And this season, it, it's looked like it has taken a – a big step forward. And then in the biggest game of the year, a bad punt returned for a touchdown. Now part of that could have been on the head coach choosing to do what they did the plays before that. The, the block field goal. Um, I'm not advocating for a firing of a position coach, but I, special teams have, have hurt Oregon for a long time. And this season it felt like it's good but it's not been great. And, I, and I'm just – all things are on the table, I think, for some position coaches. And I, I'm not saying they need to be fired, but I think there needs to be a long look at are we maximizing and getting the best out of each and every one of our position groups and our, and our offense, defense, special teams. Fifth one goes into, I think, a little bit of what we're talking about, maybe not from an injury perspective, but about player development. I think it's – kind of an interesting parallel conversation from at clear duck. It seems like certain teams, i.e. Oregon state, Washington state, and Utah have historically done well with player development. What do you think of Oregon's player development compared to the rest of the pack 12 of a nation hashtag odds and audibles? Um, here's what I'll say. We just talked about all the injuries Oregon's gone through, right? Oregon state, Washington state, and Utah have not had those kind of injuries. And guess what? Oregon was ranked third in the country with two games left in its regular season, had one loss. They were ha having, I mean, based upon record, they're having a better season than these other teams. And they were doing it with a lot of players. I mean, talk about player development. The whole conversation this season has been about this 1-0 mentality, right? Has been about filling in and, and – and Next man up. Next man up. Yep. Sorry, the next man up mentality. But the one – all of this is like – it's it's, it's all, all it. about. Five is and one, right. All of that is all about – and, and I think you, I've been impressed throughout the year with how they've, they've they've replaced guys. I mean, how many times have we said it doesn't feel like they're missing a beat at this spot or at that spot? I also think yeah. there's like a there's a, there's only a, a there's a certain threshold you reach where it becomes like what are you going to do? And I think Oregon has hit that this year. Um, I mean, you run through the position groups. There's now no, not a single one where they're not hit really hard, right? Running back, they're down C.J. Verdell. I mean, he was on pace to be a conference player of the year candidate. Um, why the only was, one they're not down in is quarterback. That's it. And and you could argue Anthony's probably banged up a little bit. I mean, but just to run oh, through the yeah. receiver, you're down three guys now. 
Um, offensive line, you've been down so many players. Forsythe's been in out of the lineup. Ryan Walks hurt. Um, you know, tight ends, uh, Cam McCormick and Patrick Herbert were both lost very early. DJ Johnson's not playing right now. Defensive line um, is maybe one of the positions you're, you're least beaten up. Um, but you have had some guys miss some time there. Obviously, the edge has left, dealt with so many injuries. They're pretty healthy right now. Um, mm-hmm. Linebacker, I mean, that's been the one of the ones we talked about all season is the fact that you're down Justin Flo and you're down Drew Mathis. Jackson LeDuc just came back. Um, you know, you've gotten great play out of Jeffrey Bossa, though, and he's been filling in there. You know, the secondary, same thing. So many guys beaten up. I mean, probably three of your best five defensive backs might not play against Oregon State. And so the point I'm making is, I actually think Oregon has developed its players pretty good because they've had really impressive depth all season. Um, it's just a matter of they're they're down to their – and I'm not saying because I don't know every injury situation for Oregon State, Washington State. My assumption is that they're not at third and fourth string players at certain positions at this point in the season and having to use guys that, frankly, they wouldn't they didn't expect they'd have to use. I mean, again, mm-hmm. I mean, just talk about the fact that they have Jeffrey Bossa, a freaking yeah. safety, playing inside linebacker. Um, that's incredible player development, in my perspective. Think about all the different players that have started different offensive line positions. I guess I'm getting more fired up than I expected I would. Um, <laughs> and, and part of that is is because it, it it feels like there's a sense from the fan base, and I totally get it because that was a really bad loss, but that everything is broken and that Oregon is a disaster. I'm seeing a lot of comments that are saying, Mark, you know, Mark Cristobal, great recruiter, great culture builder, terrible in-game coach, bad player development coach. I the in-game coaching stuff I can understand because there have been some head scratchers this season. The rest of it, I think he's really good at. I, mean, I think the player development, you know, aspect of this is a little bit ludicrous, um, based upon how many guys they've had to shuffle in there. I think it's been really admirable this whole year, and it's been one of the things that I think has been something we've championed all year is the fact that man, look, it just seems like they're they're still figuring it out, even though they're down so many guys. So. I don't know. There's my mini rant. I don't know if you guys have a, a disagreement with it, but that's where I'm at. I think it, the season that Oregon has and the injuries that they've gone through, like you went through, speaks for the development and the scheming and the and, and look. I don't think he is elite as an in-game um, coach, but I also have to acknowledge that he is he as the head coach this program has made good in-game adjustments this year on the fly while doing it with one of their hands tied behind their backs because of all the injuries. And you have to, if, if you're going to be demanding of development and then look past the fact that all these injuries have happened and it took until the second to last weekend of the season for Oregon to lose its second game of the year, who cares how it happened? Just the fact that they, they, they had all these injuries. They're starting running back is out. Uh, they have lost two receivers that are starters. Um, they have had a tight end that's critical for them um, not be available the last couple of weeks. He also wasn't available the first couple of weeks. Their best player, Kayvon Thibodeau, has been hurt. Um, their, one of their best defensive backs has been hurt. Um, linebackers have been gutted. D-line has been up and down. And yet through all of that, they found a way to to get to to nine and one on the season, number three in the college football playoff rankings, and you're going to say they can't develop players? That seems kind of ludicrous. Well, think about all the lower star guys that Oregon has starting for them. Yeah, mm-hmm. just on both ends of the ball. I mean, DJ James, Triquez Bridges, Verone, uh, who's one of the best players on the team, Brandon Dorless, Braden Swenson, uh, like. Some most of the offensive line, like Ryan, uh, John, Ryan, 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 Ryan Walk, Ryan Walk was a former yeah. walk on, right? Um, yeah, uh, you know, Johnny Johnson, Jalen Red, you know, these Travis Dye, CJ Verdell, I mean, all these guys who were not highly rated out of high school all came into this program, all took their time in this program, all learned the traits, the tools, the trade, got bigger, stronger, faster, all of these things, and now are on NFL draft boards. So, yeah. you tell me. If they can't develop talent, look at that. I love it. I I think we've answered that question thoroughly, and I'm in total agreement. And I think you know it's emotional. What took place on Saturday is tough. I felt a little bit of it. I know fans clearly have. I think the more you get away from this, the better you'll feel. And if Oregon plays really well on Saturday and finishes its season, we get a lot. Still a lot left to play for. Of course. 
we'll have a different, you'll have a different mentality and mindset. And I, and I totally get, I just feel like this is a little bit reactionary and that makes sense because these are fans on social media reacting to a game that was really hard to watch and that thrashed, absolutely thrashed expectations for this season, you know, and it was embarrassing and surprising. So I get that. I just think it's not, we're not at the juncture yet where it's like, cause I saw, I even saw people asking, is it like, is Mara Cristobal, is it time for him? Like, do we actually want him back as the coach and that kind of stuff? Right. Yeah. Like that's. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about here? Yeah. Come on. Oh, or I mean, all find he's another he's coach. Yeah. Let me, let's, let's go call Nick Saban or Lane Kiffin and, and say, Hey, how you doing? Come, how you doing? Come on the West. <laughs> all right. This one is a really positive one to get out with, which is why I ended it here. Cause I knew we were going to deal with some not positive stuff. This is from, uh, Luke Knighton, with so many true freshmen playing, and this is another part about player development. Think about the fact that they only, and I'm just, just sorry to not jump in the question here, but I just wrote a story on, on Sunday of Oregon has 14 players that have already burned their potential red shirt years this year, that are, and a lot of them are playing a ton. Six guys have started games this year. Okay, talk about player development. They've gotten these guys ready to play, so that's just another mm-hmm. part of it. Jumping into the question from Luke. With so many true freshmen playing, who is Oregon's freshman of the year? And he gave three candidates. We can obviously pick for more. He gave Byron Cardwell, Jeffrey Boss, and Terrence Ferguson. And who is a freshman that will have a breakout season next year? And he gave three options. Ty Thompson, Dante Thornton, Troy Franklin. Um, I'll start with mine for this year. Can I go? I, I, I want to make it a tie. I think it's Byron Cardwell, and I think it's Jeffrey Bassa. Um, mm-hmm. Those two guys filled in – in spots where they were needed really badly because if Oregon doesn't get better play at inside linebacker than it had early on in the season. And those listening know who I'm referring to who were filling in for Justin Flo and how poor some of that went this season does not, they probably don't have the record we're talking about. So I think boss has been really critical. Same thing with CJ Verdell when he goes down, how tough was that? How many questions were there of who's the number two running back? Well, Byron Cardwell answered those pretty quickly. And now there's no question. We all know who the number two running back is. I think those two guys pretty clearly are the guys for this year. Um, either of you going another path, or do you, do you? Either of you guys want to pick one of those in particular? I have a hard time thinking of another name as a freshman that that makes the same kind of level of impact consistently as those two. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably, if I had to lean between the two, lean on Jeffrey Bassa over Cardwell, but I, I I think they're both really stand out. Jared? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the impact is Jeffrey Bassa because it's such a harder thing for him to do moving from safety true. to linebacker. Yeah. And obviously it's a tough thing for Cardwell to step up as a true freshman, um, but he looks pretty good. I like that. And I like how Jeffrey Bossa looks too. Uh, I just think that Bossa's impact is is just bigger on the team. Um, I've also liked both the freshman tight ends, like to, you know, at least shout them out. And Terrence Ferguson, Maliki Madaval, they're both good. Yep. They both have a lot of intangibles. They both, if they are used properly, you you can look at them and be like, oh, this could be something down the line. Um, and Oregon's got a you know, team full of those guys. So, but for sure, I think as as of today, the season ended tomorrow, the freshman of the year award for the Oregon football team, Jeffrey Bassa. You kind of swayed me there because it's not just, I think if you, you could argue that their contributions have been fairly equal in terms of winning, helping you win football sure. games. But what Bassa's sure. had to do moving from a defensive back position into inside linebacker, that's really rare. It's tough. And difficult to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go and look good doing it. Yeah, I'll go. Boston. Yeah, he's he's played so good. We've, I think, all three of us are kind of in the agreement of like, why move him back to safety? Yeah, and I, well, it's, it's the different. idea that if he looks this good doing it at linebacker, what does he look like in his natural position? That's true. That's the question. I don't. I don't have an answer. Um, you've swayed me. I'm going Bossa, and I'm also of the belief that this is going to be one where man, if he like, it, it, does he stay at inside linebacker next year? It's going to be a storyline we follow. If he moves back to nickel or safety or somewhere in that like boy like is he, if he can play at a really high level at one of those spots this guy's gonna be really good i, I think he's got to mm-hmm. be a starter next year regardless of what spot it's at real, real quick i can they afford to move him back to safety because of the lack of depth 
at inside linebacker because Drew Mathis is gone mm -hmm. after this season. Um, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, unless they file for a medical redshirt, which would be tough, but I don't know. It's just, I mean, he's a, he's a six year senior already. Um, yeah. He's gone and you, you don't have a lot of depth there anyways, because Isaac Slade Matuatia transferred out. I, I understand TJ Dudley is coming into the program. Um, I understand Harrison Taggart's coming into the program, but you, you've got, I, I, you know, a lot of questions at that position depth wise. And I don't know if I almost kind of argue you keep him there just from a depth perspective. If you keep him there from a depth perspective, he's not going to see the field. That's true. You still have Justin Flo, Keith Brown, and Jackson LaDuke coming back. So well, he, I, I think, think he's better than Keith Brown, though. So he's he's, better, play he's, better, he's better than two of those guys, pretty clearly. But the flow sure. part. Oh, 100%. The flow but that's part is where I kind of go. He probably isn't starting over Justin Flo. But then I also go, if he goes back to nickel, is he starting over Bennett Williams or Jamal Hill? I, I don't. I mean, this is where I kind of like, I know we're now way down the line here and off the question a little bit, but kind of an interesting thought process of like, where does he actually likely see more field time and maybe the answer is you end up moving Williams or, or Hill to a safety spot assuming Verone McKinley doesn't return which I think is a possibility at this point and then that kind of reshuffles a thing and then Bossa can slide in at nickel and Bennett Williams could also this could be the end of the line for him from an eligibility perspective if he wanted to be um it's a tough one trying to figure out what what the, how this is going to work I just think he has to be a key part of this defense next year and, and I will be surprised frankly yeah if it's not. I think he will I don't it, I don't think it'll matter what position he'll play. I think it'll be a key part All right. from a D line. Yeah. All right. And then a, a, a breakout choice for next year. Um, he's given us Ty Thompson, Dante Thornton, Troy Franklin. I think those are all great choices. There's a pretty good, I think pretty high likelihood. All three of those guys are starting next year, which makes them easy candidates. Um, mm -hmm. Another name that popped into my head, assuming that we just, I just brought up the Verone McKinley transfer thing. Damon David, maybe a name to kind of just keep an eye out. And that's one that hasn't really shown anything this year. I think he has two tackles and they're both in the second half in a game that was decided against Colorado. Um, he's not exactly popped a bunch. <laughs> we heard so much in the off season about him. Every time his name's brought up, it's with a lot of, this guy's going to be a guy. Um, that might be a name in the secondary. Um, other than that, there's, I can't really think of him unless maybe it's a seven McGee taking a step. Um, There's a clear answer here. Come on, guys. Besides the three we've mentioned? Yeah. Go ahead. It's Jackson Powers Johnson. Is it? That's the clear answer? Yeah, he's going to be the starting center next year. Where's Forsyth going? He's already said he's coming back. He's already said he's coming back? Yeah. yeah he said, uh, back to me today. He said Never that. Mind. All right. Jackson Powers Johnson. <laughs> Sorry, bud. I tried. <laughs> I mean, now, I think you could argue for that should go. I mean, but you could also argue Jackson Powers Johnson could start at one of the guard spots if there's a reshuffling. Like that's certainly yeah. possible. Oh, 100 percent I just figured, not here yet. I just figured Forsyth has had has had such a good season. I wouldn't be surprised to see him go. I mean, obviously yeah, he missed like, a few uh, weeks, but he was like top ten on Mel Kuyper's draft board for centers for such a long time. Yeah. It was like a very definitive, like, oh yeah, I'm coming back. Like Yeah. It it was it was a it was surprising actually yeah it was um i think to answer the question or real quick to about this question you guys both brought up jeffrey bassa and damon david not to hark on the quarterback stuff but what we've heard about damon david and jeffrey bassa all year about being dudes is what we haven't heard about the three freshman quarterbacks like we've heard a ton of stuff about damon david and Jeffrey Bossa being guys that say, hey, we don't know when they're going to play, but when they finally get on the field, they're going to be good. Yeah. We already feel confident in that. Like, that's what we've heard. Um, so I think those two guys are, make sense of Eric bringing up Damon David is good. Um, I think Seven McGee makes a lot of sense too, especially as a punt returner, kick returner, now that Pittman's gone. Um, and then I think he's going to have a bigger role within the offense with Jalen Red um, graduating and Pittman also moving on at, on the offensive side of the football. Um, can I take Jason Jones? Like, I know he's not a true freshman, but. Sure. 
I feel like I feel like he's had some really good moments this season and is going to position himself where if maybe Brandon Dorless or Popo Amabe go pro, which could happen, mm-hmm. I, I think he's in a position where he could he could have a big year next year. That's a good name. Any other ones, Jared? I do like the Jason Jones one. Big Jason Jones guy here. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, just from the obvious one, the Ty Thompsons, the Franklins, the Thorntons of the world. Yeah. Um, and if we're going just class of twenty twenty one. I think those are my, those are probably the biggest selections. Um, yeah, oh, I, I do like the Jason Jones one though. I think he's been, I think he's been pretty good in, in times that he's played. You know, the D line's a deep group, but he's a different different type of player than Oregon has in their roster. And I think that'll come in big once he, you know, just has another full year to develop, another full year to learn everything and get leaner, but also get a little faster and just see how it goes. That's all we got for questions. Uh, unless we've got any parting thoughts, Matt, I think that's I think that's where we're wrapping it. Cool. No, I I, I think uh, thank you for submitting these questions. Uh, it's been a heck of a of a season. We'll still continue doing these mailbags, um, and so thank you for submitting all of them throughout the year. Uh, it's been I'm sure for Eric uh, a hefty job to sort through them all because we get a ton, and that's very very much appreciated. So. Uh, until Tuesday's edition of the Odds and Audibles podcast, when we break down what happens uh, from media availability with head coach Mark Cristobal and his coordinators, um, you've been listening to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.